one of the things that uh, we're going to be focusing on today, you'll see that I've got kind of a background in uh, cybersecurity before I came into uh, doing uh, Citrix kind of full time. So I uh, had a lot of experience with penetration testing and vulnerability assessments uh, from the network as a whole. And so one of the things we're going to get into is really kind of how that uh, niche aspect of networking and security kind of comes full circle on the Citrix side. So we're really going to go in and take a look at some of the Citrix uh, security offerings. Uh, probably the biggest one and the most uh, well-known one is going to be the application firewall. Uh, this is a feature of the Netscaler. So if you've got a application delivery control and you've got a platinum license, you have access to the uh, Netscaler application firewall. You can also get a kind of an a la carte version of the uh, Netscaler that just does that as a virtual client. So it doesn't do all of the uh, Netscaler functionality, just the application firewall piece of it. We're also going to go in and talk about uh, the management and analytics system. Some of you guys may have heard of the MAS appliance or the MAS appliance, depending how you want to pronounce it. Uh, the big thing is this is a really important tool for being able to go in and look at what is going through our Netscaler. So as the Netscaler becomes more and more critical uh, and we start sticking more and more stuff on the Netscaler, being able to actually manage that appliance or multiple appliances is going to be really, really uh, valuable. And then being able to actually look at what that data is, uh, is really kind of a big uh, driving force for uh, where we're going with the uh, product. Uh, we'll also go ahead and talk a little bit about uh, PCI compliance, kind of start off with that, where the uh, app firewall came from and where it is going, how it fits into uh, uh, that piece of the uh, e-commerce puzzle. So if you are doing e-commerce and you are dealing with credit card numbers and confidential information, what are you doing to go in and protect that? And uh, the Netscaler actually has some really nice things that can help us with that process. Yeah. Uh, and when we go in and start talking about all of these security functionalities, the big question is, well, what are we really exposed to? So we'll go in and actually take a look at some of the attacks and uh, uh, things that are out there, how hackers can go in and look at our environment. Uh, unfortunately, not going to have time to turn everybody into a hacker or show you kind of uh, even a, a piece of that, but we will go in and look at what our network looks like to the hacker, what type of attacks the hackers are performing, and then probably most importantly, how can we go in and prevent those? Yep. So that we're going to get into a little bit of the prevention side. We'll talk about uh, some of the uh, attack signatures that the Netscaler can natively go in and identify and be able to prevent. And then like I mentioned with the MAS appliance, we want to know what is happening. And so there's a lot of valuable things that we can do with the uh, MAS appliance, especially on the analytics side. As it relates to security, they've got a component that kind of nails it right around the head. Security insight. What is going on security-wise? What is going on uh, attack-wise as well as protection-wise? And so security insight is going to go in and give us some really valuable information uh, inside of the MAS appliance as to how heavily attacked we are and what we are doing to go in and prevent uh, these types of attacks. Yeah. So let's start with the application firewall. This is a really powerful feature. A lot of people would say this is the most powerful feature on the Netscaler. So I know a lot of people are buying Netscalers to go in and do uh, load balancing and content switching. That's feature number one and number two in terms of uh, quantity of deployments. A lot of people going in and getting the Netscaler because of the full SSL VPN capabilities and ICA proxy. Uh, but when you really look at the intelligence behind it and the capability and really kind of the uh, overall driver for what we can do with this, the App Firewall is probably one of the most powerful uh, features that is out there. Uh, like I mentioned, if you've got a Netscaler and you've got the Platinum Edition, you get access to this. Uh, you can also go in and purchase a Netscaler application firewall. And then it's kind of a standalone, uh, a la carte feature of that uh, product. Now, when we start talking about firewalls, a lot of people go in and start looking at uh, what they traditionally think of as firewalls. So your network firewall, and you start going in and looking at some of the offerings from uh, Juniper or Palo Alto, uh, your uh, Cisco firewalls. That's not what this is. This is getting into a niche area of layer seven. And so uh, I always tell everybody that you should probably use this as part of a layered approach. Yes, we should have a network firewall. Uh, that goes in and makes sure that when you're coming in to access our websites, 
that you are only trying to access web. You're coming in on port 80 or port 443 only. So I'm going to go ahead and keep you from being able to FTP to my servers. I'm going to keep you from being able to RDP to my backend servers. Great. But from the web standpoint, you could come in and actually make web requests that are malicious. And so that's why we need a layer seven firewall to look at that web traffic, look and see what's going on. And then if you're trying to do something malicious, either block those attacks or find different ways to be able to go in and mitigate them. Okay? And so that's really what the application firewall brings to the table. When we start talking about these firewalls, uh, a lot of times people go in and equate this to either a positive or a negative security model. If you're not familiar with that, a negative security model uh, is kind of like antivirus. It goes in and protects us from the things we know. Okay? And so we go in to define what bad stuff is, and we can block that. Okay? On the other side, you've got the positive security model. And uh, what this does is allows us to go and define what good behavior is, and then only allow good things in. And so uh, uh, there's kind of a back and forth, which one of those is better? What the uh, firewall is going to do is it's going to use a hybrid approach. It's going to go in and allow us to prevent certain types of attacks and known bad stuff that's out there. All find things by identifying good stuff and then only letting define good stuff into the environment. Also, this is going to work on the request side and the response side. So as clients come in and make requests, uh, are these malicious? On the response side, there's certain things that we can do. Are we leaking out things that we shouldn't be? And we can step in and prevent that as well. So a lot of uh, benefit on both the request and the response side using this hybrid approach. Yeah. What does the management side of it look like? And that's where this uh, MAS appliance comes in. Yeah. And uh, this is a standalone virtual machine. So you can go out, you can get this from your MyCitrix account, put on your hypervisor of choice and stand it up, and then tell it about your network, uh, your uh, net scalers, and what type of resources you have. Works with pretty much the whole family. MPX, VPX, SDX, uh, even works with the CPX if you're going that route. And so it lets us be able to go in and monitor and manage our environment. Really kind of a uh, critical component. Uh, it is free if you've got uh, uh, less than 30 bits that you need to go in and work with. Um, if you need more than that, they will go in and sell you licenses for whatever quantity you need. Yeah. Now, on the management side, we had a tool in the past that was called Command Center. Uh, the management side of the MAS appliance replaces that. So going in and being able to see entities at a glance, being able to see the environment at a glance, uh, what's up, what's down, what's working, what's not, the MAS appliance is going to go in and give us that capability. And so it is going to be the replacement for Command Center. The Insight uh, product used to have what was called an Insight Center. That's where we actually get all of our cool analytics about what's happening. All of that has been ported over to the MAS appliance. So all the functionality that we had in the Insight Center, MAS appliance is going to go in and deliver to us. So it provides us a single tool for being able to manage and analyze our traffic within the environment. Really powerful uh, component. Okay. One of the big things it does is it takes what they call an app-centric view. So instead of just going in and saying our entities up or down, we can really go in and say, well, as an application, I need this and this and this. And then be able to actually view a state of, is everything working? And it can go in and provide us that information so we get a more of a application level view instead of just entities. Okay. We can also go in and use the MAS appliance. We can centralize our SNMP alerting. So we can go in and have one place to actually look at uh, SNMP alerts across all of our net scopes. Okay. Yes, some people still go out and they've got money spent on Splunk or SolarWinds or something like that. That's great. If you don't, Citrix is giving you a very powerful tool here to be able to go in and view all that stuff in uh, one location. Same thing with syslog. We can go in and consolidate all of our syslog information, be able to see what is happening across all of our net scalers all from one place. Okay. And then most importantly, the analytics. We're going in and pulling all of this information into the MAS appliance, really lets us get it hands on and actually see what users are doing. They break this down into kind of four categories here. Uh, if we're just talking about web traffic in and out, they've got what's called web insight. Let's us see quantity of request, quantity of requests over time. 
Let's us see where those requests are coming from geographically, how they're being distributed on the back end. A lot of value going through the net show. As we get into Zen App and Zen Desktop, you've got what's called HDX Insight. What is going on with that uh, ICA traffic? The uh, gateway product is going in and processing that traffic in and out of the environment. The Maz appliance can go in and view that information and tell us some really valuable stuff about what is going on with ICA. Okay. Now, I said that goes along with the gateway. They've also got a separate gateway insight. That is if you're using the gateway for a full SSL VPN. We can go in and get a uh, very good uh, uh, detailed reporting of who is doing uh, VPN stuff, what it is they're connecting to, and uh, be able to actually go in and see a lot of the details about that traffic flow. And then, like I said, as we play off of the app firewall, that's a security component. What are we seeing security-wise? And so Security Insight provides us some real valuable information about the different types of attacks that are out there and the different things that we can go in and do to kind of prevent those. Okay. So let's jump in and talk about the uh, app firewall. Okay. One of the original designs of the app firewall was to protect against what we call the top 10 list that came from OWASP. This is the uh, uh, organization of web application security. Okay? And so this is the uh, web application security project. These guys are identifying vulnerabilities that are out there. And so they're going in and they're working with different organizations and saying, here's how we are being attacked. And so the app firewall was designed to go in and protect and mitigate those types of attacks. Okay? The modern Netscaler has kind of shifted focus from the open source project to one that actually carries a lot more weight. Okay? It's called PCI, Payment Card Industry. And this is where the uh, organizations that accept uh, credit cards have gone in and said, here's things that are uh, detrimental to this online experience. We need to make sure that you are protected against these things. Very similar to the OWASP top 10 list, just actually uh, PCI compliance is really a big uh, component that a lot of people have to uh, adhere to. And so they position the Netscaler to help with that process. Okay? In fact, they've actually embedded into the Netscaler a reporting functionality. So if I jump over here and actually uh, show you uh, my Netscaler, okay? I can dig in here. I've Sure, let me log in here. And then one of the things that it does is it lets me go in and generate reports. And so I can go in and generate a PCI compliance report to really be able to see where my Netscaler stacks up as far as how I have it configured with the goal of being uh, PCI compliant. And so uh, this will go in, it's, uh, you'll see it's using PCI uh, version uh, 3.2. And so there are certain things that we should do if we are trying to meet PCI compliance. Now, this goes in and really kind of gives you the executive summary, certain things you should be doing. First of all, it says you should probably have uh, some type of firewall to protect backend data. Uh, I have not enabled that. It kind of tells you that right there. So if that is kind of a requirement, um, I'm a little bit lacking. Okay? You want to get real technical? It says uh, don't use vendor supplied defaults. Okay? Uh, this is a lab. It's pretty much uh, fresh out of the box. And guess what? We're using the default username and password. And so it goes in and tells me I am not in compliance and kind of guides me in the direction of how to go in and uh, improve that. And so uh, this kind of gives me an idea of what I am doing that's good uh, and where I have room for improvement. Okay? Now, does this make me PCI compliant? No, obviously I have to go in and do the legwork uh, to get myself in compliance, but does a really good job of looking at what the standards are for PCI, what my configuration is, and am I going in and helping my cost or not? Okay? Now, when we go in and start talking about becoming PCI compliant, okay, what they're talking about is there are a lot of attacks and vulnerabilities out there. What are we really doing to go in and try to uh, prevent those? Okay? And so uh, we've actually got a really neat lab environment set up that allows us to simulate a lot of those uh, types of attacks. Uh, so I've got my app firewall uh, turned off, and then if I wanted to go in and actually perform some uh, pretty common attacks, I could. 
And so uh, I've got diagrammed up here a lot of the different things that a hacker might try to do to go in and uh, exploit my environment. So uh, you'll see they can do things like buffer overflows, pass too much data to the back end, overwhelm the operating system, the hosting platform, or the app, cause it to break and leak out information. Yep. Or they might go in and do SQL injection. This is where they can actually embed SQL code into an input box and change the way that my backend application works. Yep. And so then they can go in and actually input data into my SQL database or manipulate that data. Cross-site scripting, this is kind of a, a lot of back and forth. This is where they can go in and embed code onto my web page. And then the next person that comes in, they think they're interacting with my very well-respected website, but they're actually executing code that a hacker has placed on my website. And so that can go in and actually be detrimental to the environment. Okay. Uh, we can also see we've got some protections down here um, for some of the back and forth. So this is where I'm sending something to the user, like a cookie, like a form field, uh, and I want to make sure they don't mess with it. I don't want them going in and changing the prices of objects. I don't want them to go in and tamper with cookies. And so we've got different types of protections that uh, are going in and looking at what's being presented. Is this good or is this bad? Yeah. Here's an example of a buffer overflow attack. They're passing too much data in either a form field or a URL or a cookie and breaking stuff. Yeah. Here's a SQL injection. What they're doing is I'm just asking for something simple like a username. And then they can go in and supply a username like they should, or, and then they can go in and use SQL characters and keywords to actually change what's being uh, passed to the back end. And this can go in and create a manipulation of my code. And so if I'm trying to authenticate that this password for Bob matches Bob's password, or one needs to equal one. And since one does equal one, I can go in and this hacker can present themselves as a authenticated user. Yep. Uh, here's an example of cross-site scripting. Hacker comes in and posts something to this web page. It gets regurgitated out to the next legitimate user that comes in. They think they're interacting with my website. They're actually interacting with hacker code. And then this can go in and ask for username and passwords and just send these out. And you can build a repository of my user's uh, credentials. Yep. Here's cookie tampering. We actually have the application setting a cookie, passing that to the uh, end user, and then something is happening on the end user and they're going in and maliciously changing that cookie. And so when they come back, we respond to malicious code or different values than what we uh, sent them. Yep. And so that can go in and actually cause some issues. Here you'll actually see we've got some response side protections. So stuff that the back end is providing to the client, such as credit cards. We can go in and actually make sure that we are not leaking out credit card data to the end user. Yep. Safe object means uh, it's not a credit card, it's something that I define. We can use a little bit of regex and go in and say, let's not leak out phone numbers, social security numbers, ID numbers, things of that nature. We can also go in and say, let's not leak out HTML comments. And so if I wanna make sure that we're sanitizing our code, not providing uh, any of these things here, my net scaler and the app firewall can look and see what's being presented to the client and protect that information. Yep. Let me show you kind of what this uh, looks like. Yep. So without the application firewall in here, I've got a really nice uh, demo website. Yep. Like I said, I wasn't gonna teach you guys how to be hackers, uh, but this makes it really easy to go in and demo some of those attacks. For instance, a buffer overflow. Yep. If I go in and click on this, uh, I was able to successfully pull up this page and if you look in this address bar, it goes in and pulls up this web page, and then it passes a large volume of text. And then the idea is I want to overwhelm the buffer that's handling these requests in and out and actually send executable code. Okay? And so for a hacker, they could go in and max out this buffer and then append to this commands. They would run outside of that buffer and be able to exploit the operating system or the hosting platform or the application. Yep. Uh, you can come in here and see SQL injection. Yep. This is where it says uh, type in some value to look up. And so I can throw in my name here. Yep. Just do my last name and say search the database for this. And it does. Or I could go in and say let's look for this and then I could throw in an apostrophe 
and then say or one equals one. And so I'm rewriting the code to say make this match or make one equal one, which it does. Therefore, it would go in and execute bad stuff on the back end. Now, is this actually doing something malicious? No, but it simulates what that attack would actually look like. Right? And so I've got different things that I can go in and do very easily. Here, it says uh, cross-site scripting demo. Just says put in your name. Right? Nice and easy. Go in and put that in, and then it's kind of like a hello world example. Right? If I want to get away from what it's supposed to do, I can go in and say, here's my name, and here's some malicious script. And so I can throw this in here and uh, make this uh, run, and then what it will do is it prints my name here, but it also executes a script. Now, is this anything super malicious? No, but you can see how uh, a hacker could go in, rewrite this code, and actually make this uh, uh, a little bit more uh, uh, malicious. Yeah. Uh, on the uh, uh, response side or sessionization side, what we've got is cookies. Yeah. What this example does, and I'll go in and kind of show you with some live HTTP headers, says, what's your name? So I can put in my name, and then what it does is it sets a cookie yeah, to go in and say what the site visitor name is. And so then when you come back into this web page, you present that cookie, and the web page responds accordingly. So if I come back in here and open this up, I pass that cookie, it sees it, it knows who I am. Yeah. And so this is an application that is using cookies being passed back and forth to go in and kind of show you a customized experience. Yeah. And then if I wanted to, I could dig in and look at these cookies and say, okay, I want to go in and manipulate them. And so if I wanted to, I could pull up these cookies. The cookie's called my site visitor name. It's got my name there. And I could go in and say, let's change that. And so instead of this actually being my real name, I can go in and do something to alter it. And so uh, I'll just go and say, you know, hacker was here. And then that becomes the cookie that's going to get presented. So when we come back, sticks in that name. Yeah. And so this is an example of uh, uh, cookie uh, tampering. Yeah. We can do that with form fields, things like that. Also, credit card example. Uh, what you've got here, not real credit card numbers, uh, but kind of an example of test data. And so this actually uses some checksums. They come from Visa, MasterCard, so on. This is how you go in and validate that a credit card is real. So the credit card numbers kind of provide this. So if you're doing input validation and somebody says, you know, put in your credit card number, we can make sure that indeed it is a credit card number. Probably most concerning here is if I have a valid credit card number, why am I displaying that on the screen? And so that could be one of those vulnerabilities where my website could be leaking out credit card data. Okay. How do I prevent these types of things? And the answer is using the application firewall. And so what we're able to do is we're able to have this feature called the application firewall. It is a policy driven feature. So we've got different policies that go in and say what it is that uh, we are uh, looking for and how we want to protect. And I've got two kind of uh, demo websites. I just showed you AF web. There's a open source um, uh, website that is out there called WebGoat. So if you want to go in and play around with this, you can download WebGoat. It is more of a uh, uh, e-commerce all encompassing type of website and it's put together by an open source web project. And so they go in and really make this thing vulnerable to all the things that I've mentioned. And so uh, they've got a really nice tool for being able to go in and test out, can you go in and perform these attacks? So just to kind of show you what that looks like, they've got this website, they've got all sorts of different things going on. You And this is provided to you as an open source tool to be able to see these vulnerabilities and test out a product like the app firewall for how well it protects these different attacks. Yeah. And so I've got different uh, protections for my different sites. What are those protections? And we call them profiles. And so for my um, demo website here, I've got a profile and uh, it's got some basic settings. So 
what happens when uh, we block somebody. We're going to redirect them to this blocked page and you'll say you've been blocked by the app firewall. And so I can go in and put that in place. Uh, have that sit here and go in and uh, protect my environment. Over here, I've got my security checks. And so here's all sorts of different things that I can go in and protect against. So am I protected against buffer overflow attacks? Yes, I am. Uh, am I protected against cross-site scripting? Yes. Am I protected against uh, SQL injection attacks? That as well. Got uh, cookie consistency. I've got that protection enabled. And so this goes in and kind of is where I define how to protect the back end. And so I can go in and do some different things here to make sure hackers can't come in and maliciously exploit my back end environment. So take a look at this. Uh, if I come in and put this in place, um, we've relaxed this to the point that I can get access here. And then I can go in and do different things like try to perform a buffer overflow attack. And then when I send a large volume of uh, uh, text, it goes in and says, that's too much text. Uh, that's not allowed. And so I get redirected to this block page to say, you're not getting access to your stuff. Okay. And so I can come in here, I can access whatever I want, unless it's malicious, in which case the app firewall steps in and blocks me. And then if I needed to go in and manipulate this, like if that wasn't a real large volume of traffic, then uh, what I could do is I could come in here and edit uh, some of my settings. Okay. Here it kind of defines what a large URL is. Okay. And so it says uh, 1,024 characters. I can say, well, you know, that may not necessarily be large enough. Let's bump that up a couple hundred. And then what that's going to do is it's going to create a scenario where that uh, attack is uh, now going to be seen as legitimate traffic. So I can go in and relax this to the point where that is a uh, legitimate traffic that should be getting through. Okay. There's uh, two different examples here. Uh, the first one, this one is uh, not as long as the uh, other one. So the regular buffer overflow lets me in. If I go in and try to do buffer overflow two, that one is longer. It's more than what I put in there. App firewall steps in and pre uh, prevents that attack from reaching the back end. Here's uh, SQL injection. Yeah. Should be able to type in a uh, username and do a search. Yeah. Uh, and it works just fine. Okay. If you want to come in and do something malicious like this, then it can step in and say, no, you're trying to do something bad and prevent that from reaching the back end. Okay. So a lot of neat stuff that we can go in and do here. Same thing. You want to go in and use this legitimately? No big deal. Put a name in, search the database, looking for it. Okay. Uh, you want to come in and try to execute a script to the back end then what's going to happen is App Firewall steps in and says no. Okay. Now, something else that we can do is uh, we do go in and tend to block a lot of this stuff. We could go in and say, actually, um, you know, we might have some people that have got certain names, certain characters, things like that, that need to be present. I might want to go in and relax this and say, instead of blocking these uh, cross-site scripts, I might want to go in and escape out of them. And so what this will do is this is going to transform my request so it still gets posted to the back end, but in a non-malicious format. Okay. Can I show you what this one looks like? User comes in, they're posting their script here, and then whenever I go in and say transform it, um, what it does is it sees script tags and it changes those to print characters. Stick in the name Joe, followed by a less than sign, followed by the word script and a greater than sign, instead of Let's execute this. And so it gives me the ability to go in and uh, to transform these types of attacks so that uh, the data reaches the back end, but in a non malicious format. Okay. Something else I can do is uh, we've got uh, the uh, cookie uh, consistency here. So I've got my cookie set up, I've got what that value should be. Great. Okay. Uh, and then what happens is this is called sessionization. We're keeping track of what cookie we sent to the user, make sure we get back that cookie. And so if I go in and do something like modifying it, it can step in and say no. And so you're presenting a, uh, a modified cookie and it can go in and prevent that from happening. Okay. Here's my uh, credit card demo. 
remember I, I had all the credit card numbers in here? What they're doing is they're going in and actually looking to see, are you presenting credit card numbers? And if so, blocking that out. And so you can go in and actually uh, prevent that information from being leaked out in a readable format to the end user. Okay? They've got uh, what's called a safe object. This is where we can go and define certain types of objects like social security numbers or phone numbers. If we see these being sent to the end user, let's go in and protect them. Okay? I've got a couple of these already set up. They're just not enabled. So if I dig in here, I can go in and say, let's actually protect and make sure that we don't leak out phone numbers or social security numbers. Okay? And so this allows me to go in and then remove these or X these out so I'm not leaking out valuable sensitive data. Okay. Another really valuable component to this is what we call start URLs and deny URLs. Okay. And what that does is it allows us to go in and be able to actually say, here's things you're allowed to access or we block you. Okay. And so uh, as part of our relaxation here, we define what those URLs are. Okay. So you'll see that I'm working with uh, afweb.training.lab. That is my uh, URL. I've also got the IP address here uh, if I wanted to connect to it. And I'm saying that is allowed. You can go in and access that website. I can define, uh, this is the ICO file, the little uh, uh, file that shows up up here. Um, I can go in and look for, this is a little bit more generic, but uh, anything that is a HTML, uh, HTM, GIF, JPEG, PNG, and so on. So I can define file formats that you are allowed to access. Okay? And so uh, we can go in and put these in place, and then that defines exactly what you can come in and access. So if you want to access, they've got this allowed demo here. That is defined as a acceptable URL. And so you can come in and you can actually access that page. That demo is not a normal file extension, but with a start URL relaxation, it's fair game. Okay? This will go in and prevent forceful browsing. I can do the same thing here. Uh, this is the reverse. Remember I said positive security model and negative security model only allow in good traffic. I can go in and say what good traffic is or is not. And so I can go and define what's called a deny URL and say specifically, I don't want you to have access to this URL. And so I can go in and define exactly what I want you to have access to or not. Okay. Now, you'll see a lot of things in here that are kind of built in and not enabled. These are some protections for certain things. And so it goes in and says, uh, if you're trying to, you know, we used to have like the NIMDA virus or code red, they would go in and try to exploit certain files. I've got protections here where I can say, no, you can't access those files. You can't get into the WinNT directory. And so we can go in and enable these and prevent certain types of attacks. Okay. Now, the next scaler can actually take this a couple of steps further. And what they've done is they've embedded in what are called SNORT signatures. SNORT is a um, intrusion prevention system, and it goes in and identifies about 1,500 different types of attacks. And so you've got different SNORT rules that can look and see what you are doing maliciously. And then with the SNORT product, go in and alert you to it. They've set up the NetScaler to be able to import and utilize those snort signatures. And so what you can do is you can go in and keep this updated. You don't have to go in and update the firmware. You can just bring in these updated uh, signatures. And then you can go in and create your own custom signature to say, here's what I'm looking for. Okay? So for instance, in this example, um, they're kind of going in and looking for Shell shock. Okay? And so with shell shock, you're going in and doing certain types of manipulations that we don't want to allow. So Snort has the rules to be able to identify that. I can create my own signature here to say, I want protection for this. So if I see that you're trying to do one of these types of attacks, we need to step in and do something about it. Okay? And then what we do is we go in and create our own signatures here and then bind them to a profile. 
Okay? And so here it says, uh, what are we looking for in terms of balance signatures? I can go in and select my uh, definition of signatures that I want to go in and put in place. And then if I see you doing something that I've identified as bad, that firewall is going to go in and step in and prevent that from being sent back to the client. Yep. So a couple of neat things that we can go in and do to really go in and uh, prevent a lot of uh, malicious things. Some of you will say, well, you know, don't we want all these signatures protected? Um, no. Yep. This is where you actually do need to know your back end and what you're vulnerable to. So you've got IIS, you've got Apache. There's certain things that Apache might be vulnerable to that IIS isn't. You don't want to waste your CPU going in and looking for attacks that aren't relevant. So we go in and we can customize this to say exactly what we're looking for. Okay? Also, I see a lot of people that come in and say, well, I only want to go in and protect certain things, um, and I'm going to do that at the coding level. That's great. If you're protecting at the coding level or protecting the web server, then you can go in and say, I don't need that protection here because that attack is not going to succeed. Okay? If you don't control the code, if you don't control the back end, an intermediate system like uh, App Firewall gives you that capability. Yeah? So a lot of powerful things that we can go in and do with the Netscape. Now, if you want to take it up a notch, that's where we can go in and involve the mass appliance. Okay? This is a standalone virtual machine. You go in and bring this into the environment. And then what it does is it goes in and lets you see your net scalers at a glance. Okay? And yes, I use the word net scalers. If you've got more than one net scaler, being able to see everything all in one place is a huge benefit. That is what the uh, MAS appliance is going to let us do. Okay? So you can go in here and see different virtual servers that I've got and kind of their usage and their states. Okay? Now, if I go up here and uh, look at my networks, this is where I can go in and see kind of my net scaler out of claims. Okay? I've got one net scaler. It's got four certificates. It's got services, virtual servers, all that good stuff. And so I can go in and see these different entities all in one place and alerts. Okay? So I've got certain problems. How severe are they? All of that good stuff. Okay? More importantly, I can dive in and see my inventory. And so I've got a VPX. If I had multiples, they would all show up here. So I've got my VPX. Uh, if you go in and look at this, I can see all sorts of valuable stuff about this next scale. What I'm most excited about is the insight capability, the analytics capability. And so what we can do is we can go in and look at insight. And what it does is it allows us to very easily go in and say, here's a load balancer within my environment. I want traffic flow statistics. And so I've got this guy set up to give me um, web insight as well as my security insight. I've done that for the demo website I just showed you. Uh, I've also got kind of a sample website in here. I can go in and put that in place as well. And then what this does is this reaches out to the next scaler and it configures what's called app flow. So A, it enabled app flow for me. B, it sets itself up as a collector. This is the IP address of my MAS appliance, and it says dump app flow statistics off to the MAS appliance. And then I've got my policies to say what, and then those policies get bound to virtual service. Okay? And so as traffic goes to the environment, this is going in and dumping that traffic off to the MAS appliance. Now, I've got my security insight enabled. And so what happens is I can go in and perform these attacks like I've just shown you. Okay? Some of these are very simple to be able to go in and do. And so I am generating security traffic. I am going in performing attacks. The app firewall is going in protecting me. And then my MAS appliance and the analytics can kind of show me what's happening. And so if I dive in and take a look at this, whoops, helps while I'm out of the MAS appliance. Down here, I've got my analytics, and then I can see web traffic. And then this would go in and give me information about the different applications, the different load balancers, what we're seeing traffic-wise, okay? where that traffic is going on the back end, all sorts of really valuable stuff. Okay? I've also got security insight. 
Security Insight is about two things. One is the threat index. How heavily attacked is my website? And then it's also about the safety index. How well protected is my website? And so for everything that I go in and enable this on, it's going to come back with a threat index and a safety index. Okay? And so I can go in and look at this as past hour, day, whatever. Okay? And then it will go in and show me, here's my two websites, these are load balancers on the Netscaler, that are protected. And then I can see this guy has been heavily attacked, which I've been doing all my demos. So yes, he has a high threat index. Okay? Um, how well protected is he? Not very. Okay? And so I've got a lot of uh, attacks going on and uh, not necessarily all the protections that I need. I can go in and dig into this guy and get a little bit deeper. So over the past hour, 37 uh, different attacks. Okay? How serious are they? Uh, what have we let through? Okay? Where do they come from? Uh, everything in the lab is a private uh, IP, so uh, this is not real accurate. So uh, I guess they just assume that private IP attacks come from Nigeria, just like all the other phishing schemes, right? They're all, you know, the Prince of Nigeria and all that stuff. Well, here he is uh, attacking my environment. Okay? Uh, so you can go in and see the different types of attacks, the severity, and be able to get back some real valuable information. So how heavily attacked am I? But how uh, helpful are you know IP reputation, the uh, firewall signatures that I put in place, and so on? So what am I seeing attack-wise? And so I can go in and see the different numbers that we've uh, uh, accumulated in terms of quantity of attack. How many have been blocked? How many have been transformed? How many have we let through? Yeah. And so we can go in and see different numbers here in terms of the threat index. I can also go in and see my safety index uh, what am I doing security wise? So configuration wise, what am I doing uh, signature wise? How well protected is this website? And then the overall goal is I can use this information, make this website more protected, more refined to go in and prevent certain types of attacks that uh, come down the line. And so really, really valuable tool for being able to go in and get all sorts of information about what's going through my Nesco. Yeah. And so this is really what the insight product has been about. Now all the insights are part of the analytics inside of the MAS appliance. And so you've got all of this valuable traffic flow going through the Netscaler. It is our central point for web traffic. It's our remote access and ICA proxy. And when you add the app firewall on top of it, it's doing security. And so the uh, insight center and now the MAS appliance being able to grab that information, being able to go in and make that available to uh, the administrator to be able to see what are we seeing traffic flow wise, what are we seeing attack wise, how well protected are we, is becoming a very, very critical part of this process. So we've been using the Netscaler forever. We've been using these tools forever. Insight has been around uh, since the uh, 10.0 version of the Netscaler. The MAS appliance came in uh, a little over, uh, probably about two years ago with the 11.1 uh, version. Now it's been updated to the 12.0 version. And that's when they brought in the security insight to go in and give us above and beyond security information and how this is applying to what we're doing with the uh, application firewall. So a lot of valuable things going on with the Netscaler, a lot of really neat insight that we can get into that traffic, the security, and so on. Okay. So with that being said, what I'll do is I will turn it back over to uh, Rich. If we've got any questions, be more than happy to uh, field those from you. Okay, Matthew, thank you very much. Um, we do have a few questions that uh, people have submitted. I'm going to go ahead and uh, read those off for you, Matthew, and I'll uh, I'll, I'll try not to to uh, to butcher the terminology too badly, okay? Okay. So um, the first question says we've run into issues with uh, client side measurements enabled for Moz. The site either never loads, uh, becomes extremely slow, or some folders never show up. How can we collect end user metrics with Moz? 
Uh, good question. And probably what they're looking at there is um, what's called the uh, HTML injection. When we go in and say we want the web insight, uh, what that's looking at is that's just looking at raw statistics of I saw these requests, here's where I went in and sent them. What you can do is you can also go in and embed some JavaScript. It gets sent back to the client, executes on the client, and then provides statistics like page load times and such back to the next killer. Okay. Sometimes uh, going in and doing that on a website by website basis may go in and interfere with that. So you should be able to go in and back that out. It'll go in and cause you to lose some of those statistics, but you should regain functionality. That's really where I would go in and kind of uh, uh, troubleshoot that is uh, looking at the HTML injection. And then also probably making sure that you're up to date in terms of uh, the latest version of the uh, mass appliance. Uh, it has kind of changed over time as we did Insight 10.5, 11.0, uh, and into 11.1. And then MAS 12.0 is even better than 11.1. And so uh, going to the newer version helps fix a lot of those issues. Okay, great. Thanks, Matthew. Next question. Uh, is there a way for a .NET developer to secure code to allow use of apostrophes without the app firewall seeing it as a SQL injection? Um, great question. Uh, yes. And what a lot of people do is they go and they look at these different things that we're doing with the app firewall and they say, uh, that's stupid. Why wouldn't we just fix that ourselves? That's great. Okay. Uh, you don't need an app firewall if you are 100% perfect at coding. However, nobody is. And so we produce code, it looks good today, and then the hacker finds out how to exploit it down the road. So yes, there are a lot of things that we can go in and do. We can do input validation. Uh, if we do that so that when I say give me input, I make sure that you're actually giving me input and that it is valid and you are not doing those things, then yes, I can use secure coding instead of that feature on the next scaler. And so if you've got a uh, developer that is writing your applications on the back end and they're following those secure coding practices, that's great. Okay? The problem is when we purchase applications, we don't control that. When somebody comes in and writes those for us, we don't control that. And so if they didn't do that process, then we're left exposed. That's really where we need that app firewall and uh, that functionality. So if you've got a, uh, a .NET developer that is dotting the I's, crossing the T's, and doing all the things they're supposed to for code quality and input validation, you can go in and claw back that relaxation on the next scaler for those things. Okay? It's a situation where you can't control it that the next scaler becomes invaluable. Okay, Matthew, thanks. Um... Next question, how does Moz handle GSLB across multiple net scalers and what kind of interesting data does it show? Um, good question. Um, what we're actually seeing is most of the time going in and actually looking at the individual net scaler. So if you're not familiar with the, uh, the terminology there, GSLB is the net scaler's uh, multi-site redundancy. And so it ties in with DNS. So when you say, I need to connect to your website, it contacts the NetScaler and the NetScaler makes a intelligent DNS resolution decision. Okay? And so then that goes in and says, do I send you to one site or the other? Could be active active, could be primary versus DR. Okay? How is that gonna go in and manifest itself in the um, MAS appliance? We're not necessarily gonna see as much in terms of what did GSLB do as much as we are the actual result. Okay? The result is traffic goes somewhere and we're going to be able to see where that traffic flow is. So if we're talking about using this in front of the gateway. It's the gateway in one location is getting traffic. The gateway in the other location is not. If we're talking about web related, you're going to be able to see website in one location versus website in the other. And we should be able to see a difference in the traffic flow statistics. And then we're able to go in and make assumptions and say, why am I seeing hit counts on the DR website? And then the assumption is GSLB has kicked in, it started sending people to DR, and here's when and how much traffic. And so we're gonna be able to go in and see the results 
of GSLV at work, not necessarily the actual intricacies of what GSLV is doing. Okay, great, Matthew. Uh, we have a couple more questions. I think we have time for these. Um, first one, can you run Moz 12 with Netscaler 11.1? Uh, uh, sorry, Rich, the uh, question cut out. Can you repeat that? Oh, sorry. Yeah, can you run Moz version 12 with Netscaler 11.1? Uh, good question. Um, the general rule in the past has been no. Don't mix and match your different versions of the appliance with different versions of the Netscaler. Uh, once we get to 11.1 and 12.0, they've done a lot to go in and uh, strengthen the resiliency of that. And so the 12.0 product is what's recommended uh, for the 12.0 and 11.1 versions of the Nestor. So you should not necessarily see that be uh, a problem with uh, an app flow mismatch like we saw in legacy versions of Insight. So that should be uh, fine as long as you're using a pretty modern version of the 11.1. Okay, and uh, the last question that we have time for, um, a lot of the, uh, so, so this is from a, a Netscaler uh, user, a lot of the pushback we get from application owners when we implement XSS protection in App Firewall is regarding bad tag alerts. Can you describe how a bad tag can be leveraged maliciously? Um, what they're doing is they're going in and using um, the uh, tags to go in and say, here's what's being passed back and forth. And so the application is actually labeling that. And when it gets presented to the back end, it is uh, looking like it's script from the client. And so certain types of scripting go in and use that. And uh, it can go in and create uh, certain types of problems. The way that we can actually... Uh, back that protection down a little bit is in certain situations where the application needs those uh, uh, tags, we can go in and create a relaxation and say, let's not protect this for certain things uh, for certain fields. And so we can go in and actually uh, relax that protection a little bit in certain places where we know that they're using certain tags for passing data back and forth. Okay, Matthew, thank you. Thanks for um, the great questions. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, this webinar was recorded and we will be emailing out a link to the recording in the next couple of days. I also wanted to mention that the content Matthew has been covering in this webinar is um, from and is covered in an upcoming Netscaler course that Matthew's teaching. Uh, the next one he's teaching is on uh, February 26th, so, so less than two weeks away. And there's a, uh, there's a five-day course that covers both App Firewall and Moz. If, if you don't want content, if you don't want both the App Firewall and Moz content, those um, courses are also separated into two distinct courses. The App Firewall class is a three-day class and Moz is a two-day class. So you can either take it all in one week in five days or you can just take a portion of uh, of whatever feature you, you, you want to focus on or you want to cover. So if you'd like more information on that, um, please feel free to reach out to us. The best way to reach us is info at layer8training.com or directly to me uh, rich at layer8training.com. Uh, we thank you all for your time. We especially thank Matthew who uh, delivered this webinar during his lunch break as, he, uh, as he's teaching a class. So Matthew, I hope you saved up some of your voice uh, for the rest of the week, but we really appreciate uh, you taking the time to, uh, to present this webinar today. Uh, awesome. With that, we will sign off. And again, we, uh, we thank you very much for attending our webinar. Take care.